God had said after day five, he blessed them that they would be fruitful and multiply. The blessing of God on the, um, the marine life, the birds in the air, and we'll see also for the cattle and everything that lives above water on terra firma. This begs the question about the dinosaurs, right? I think dinosaurs are so cool. And not only the, the um, history of them and the fossils that we have and what you discover, these m- massive creatures, a brontosaurus in the size of it or the terrifying T-Rex. And people think that there's some kind of disconnect. There's no disconnect. All those creatures have just been created. They're all here on the planet. Now, there are some who believe in the gap theory. Maybe you espouse the gap theory. That is, between verse 2 and uh, verse 3, where there's this, this chaos took place, so to speak, where the earth is without form and without, uh, it's void and without form, and there was darkness on the face of the deep. Some believe that in this gap theory, which, I mean, it's, it's, it's quite a uh, fascinating teaching to get so much from silence. But basically, there was a time in the past where Satan came and fell, and it destroyed the original creation, and so this whole gap theory uh, thing. And um, there's also another mindset that is these days are thousand-year increments. It took a thousand years. What's the difference? If you're going to create the solar system in one day, and you're an all-powerful, all-knowing God, or you're going to take a thousand years, what's the difference? Or so you give it... uh, 13.8 13.8 billion years. What's the difference? It's still an in, incredible work. But God says he did it in one day. Now, I know for some here, that's just, you go, you know, I love Jesus, but I don't know about this. I think Jesus did come and die on the cross. The Bible says that he was here in the whole creation story, that nothing was made without him. Jesus talks about the creation story about Adam and Eve, and he talks about it like it's a fact. It's, it's not mythology. And that's what's happening in the church today is there's this huge move to go away from the literal teaching of the scriptures and to make things mythological. There's, oh, there's lots of myths, and there's this and that. She's, okay, as soon as that happens, what part of this book is a myth and what part's real then? And who, who judges what's the myth and who, what's real? I do, right? I become the judge. But you see, I come to this book, and I'm not to judge. I open the book and read it. This book judges me. I don't judge it. I was having lunch with a pastor who believes in evolution. He doesn't believe the Red Sea parted. He doesn't believe that, you know, Jonah was swallowed by a great sea creature for three days and three nights, as it says in the story of Jonah. And, and I said, I was asking, because these are all the stories that they usually do away with. Or they, and he goes, oh, yes, you know, I taught Genesis. It's a poem. It's a creation poem. It's not literal. We, we, we all know factually we evolved. So really, factually, we know that. And I, I said, you, you see the difference between you and I on every Sunday morning? He's a preacher. I'm a preacher. As I said, when, I have a very simple choice. When I come to this book, I just decide what passage I'm going to teach because I believe it's literally the word of God. And you come to this book and you have to first decide what you're going to teach and then ask yourself, is it a myth? Is it a poem? Is it not real? You see, folks, if that was the case for God's word, I would go find something else to do. I'd go sell real estate. Right? I like real estate. I'd go do real estate. Because as soon as you lower the authority of the scriptures, it no longer has authority to speak to the issues of your life. That's why people remove the authority of the scriptures so that that's your interpretation. We know that it's been mistranslated many times. Every single one of these things are lies and ways for you not to trust the authoritative word of God. goes on in verse 26, man is created. Verse 26, then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Notice the plural in this, like us, our, our likeness. Let them have dominion over the sea, 
of the, the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image, and in the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. Then God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. First, we want to talk about who's the us and our that we're created, that we bear the image of God in some way. You are an image bearer of the divine being, your creator. And the us, the our, is the trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit that have this perfect fellowship in the, these three individuals that make the one true and living God. Like I have three fingers here, if I only had that on my hand. There's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Father is not the Son, and the Son is not the Father, and the Spirit is not the Son. They are all individuals, but the three of them make the true one. Uh, it's this unified deity of the uh, triune God, three in one. That's who we are created in the image of. And what is that image? Because we know that Jesus tells a woman at the well in John 4, 4 that God does not have flesh and bone. God is spirit. God is this, uh, you know, $5 word of incorporeal, which means that, you know, you're, there's, there's no physical attribute to you. And so we have to look at it and um, what is meant by that. So we are spiritually, meaning that the real you is not physical because the real you, when this body dies, the real you goes on to heaven. You get a new body, the scriptures say, eternal in the heavens, a new body. So the real you is not physical but spiritual, your personality, who you are. Now people ask me, you know, when we get to heaven, are we going to know each other? And I always smile because I say, well, I, we know each other now, right? They go, yeah, we know each other now. I, I, I hope we're not more stupid in heaven <laughs> than we are here, right? I know you now. I'll know you there. And uh, so I don't think we'll need name badges in heaven. I think I'm just going to know, hey, there's John. John's, John's here. He made it. Praise the Lord. Glad he got in the door. <laughs> right? There's the three surprises of heaven. There, there's those who get there, and you're like, oh, dang, I didn't think he'd make it, right? <laughs> And then there are those who are not there here, like, where's Sally? We thought, oh, she didn't make it, oh no. And the third surprise is that I'm there, that I actually made it by God's grace. Okay? So we are spiritually, mentally, we have three dimensions to our being that God has that he gives to us. A, a person is defined as a, an individual that has thoughts, emotions, and a will. I have reasoning capacities where I think through things. Unlike the animal kingdom that are given instinctual um, inclinations, they operate by instinct. They birds go south. I mean, they just have this God hardwires instinct. But humans reason. They have thoughts. God, God has thoughts. He reasons. We also have emotions. And the scriptures talk about the Lord being angry. Or this, in this sense, he's very happy. He's a, and, and it was good, right? He has emotions. He gives those to us. Obviously, all these things are imperfect. My reasoning is imperfect. My emotions are imperfect. They're not always lined up. And then I have a will. I can make decisions. Based on my thoughts and my emotions, I can make a decision. God does the same thing. He has a will. So we are mentally, socially, we're created in his image that God has fellowship within the tri trinity of, of heaven itself. And he also wants socially relationship with us. So we can socially have relationship with God. We can socially have relationship with others. This is very unique because uh, evolution gives no place for it, and that is morally. God is a righteous moral God. The, the, the Judeo-Christian ethic is a moral ethic that talks about all moral issues in a very strong way to declare what God's heart is about it. And so when we have the ability to line ourselves up with by his grace and by his spirit morally to do what's right.